Hello, I'm here in Vienna, Austria at the Kunstraum am Schauplatz and I'm now entering the exhibition, my solo exhibition, which is A, a kind of retrospective and B, a show of new works and this room is all about what I have seen as a kid in regards of art and I have grew up with uh, drawings and prints by uh, Alfred Kubin and this is one of his prints that belongs to my brother. This, this print you can see how uh, Alfred Kubin made uh, satirical drawings of the people of Wernstein, Wernstein, Austria, and that is actually the, the village where my grandfather grew up and my part of my family lived. So he used to uh, make drawings and prints about the, the absurd and uh, funny little uh, people living in Wernstein. And because Alfred Kubin had uh, some financial problems once in a while as an artist back in the 30s, uh, 40s that was definitely usual so he went once in a while to, to my family who owned the back then in German they called it Kreisler a uh, form of uh, supermarket before there were supermarkets uh, corner shops basically and then he would bring us a print and get uh, two weeks of food and stuff like that. So there originally we had a lot of prints, but then you have a lot of children and a lot of aunts and a lot of uncles and suddenly you end up with uh, only five prints. And there are four prints in this exhibition because the fifth one I couldn't get because of COVID because the fifth print is uh, in ownership of my uncle and uh, because I didn't want to risk him getting an uh, infection of COVID, we decided to leave that uh, print out of this exhibition. So along comes a new series that is kind of related to what I played as a kid. I was very often I was playing in my fantasy world uh, and I played Dungeons and Dragons and Warhammer and all of that and that was a way for me to escape uh, from well let's say it wasn't always easy to be the one kid uh, that had, did not have uh, the correct Austrian sounding last name and who had, let's say, eyes that weren't completely round and blue-eyed like sometimes people wanted me to have. So what if I wanted to escape from uh, racism and also, also homophobia, I, I went not to metal or novels I went to or poetry as some other people go and it's amazing. I went instead to fantasy and science fiction role playing games and board games. So I decided to engage in a new painterly practice and here I, I started to uh, paint objects on on geometric forms 
and they are tiny but oh 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 boy oh 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 or trans person or whatever you want to call it, they take a long time. This one of these small things takes me two days to complete. And yes, so yeah, and they're hex board, meaning you can you can play with that. I actually wrote a full uh, set of rules and up to five people can play with that and this is uh, this is a game board for three people and every person would start out on uh, the most utmost corner of the of the of, of the gaming field so this would be a starting point this would be a starting point and this could be a possible starting point and you would need to complete these things we like say now this is completed and it's a full hexagon so you can move to the next space and there's a set of rules when you can move to the next place what do you have to do what happens if you move to the next thing this is all for next and other discussion of this work because it uh, that's a rule-based discussion. It takes at least 10 to 20 minutes to explain that whole thing. And that's, that's the second uh, uh, object that I've placed on the floor. So. And or, I have now decided to not show you the videos because this is a video and I think talking about videos with sound in a video is kind of counterproductive. So this is another uh, work of mine. It was actually a commission or a test for a commission for an illustration of a fantasy book. And that's when the first time I really started to make uh, colors into my abstract shapes. And it's, it's in this room because it is a departure from my previous work that was always uh, only in one color. So let's move to the next work that actually has the same color uh, than my hat. You see, nearly the same color, maybe I think two or three grades off. And you can see uh, I like I like ornaments. I'm not like uh, like Mr. Lowe's. I think ornaments are good. They are fine. And Austria, with its hatred of uh, maximalism and horror vacui should really learn to accept that uh, more is more and less is less. I know this is me making a joke and I don't think that uh, hanging paintings uh, back to back is really making uh, for a good show. So, so this is one of my earliest paintings. This one is from 99, when I was still in school, a young wee person. So, and because when this show opened, there we already had something like a soft lockdown. I mean, I, it's a big show, but I'm still only able to ha have four people at the same time in the exhibition so to get at least during the opening some media presence on Instagram and stuff like that I decided to hang this object here in a way that you could position yourself under it and make a selfie yes yes it's it's okay if it moves if it shakes I mean after all, it's my object, I have to touch it. But then it's, uh, Franz West would have called it, a, it's, it's called a Passstück. So therefore, I think it's completely acceptable 
for me to touch it and yes i don't want any everybody to touch it but if some kids decide to touch it because they really really want to have, get a feeling of the object then i'm completely a-okay with that and then it can float and all of that so yes yeah and i like that 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 see me quasi fantastical magical moment where an object can float inside of an exhibition space but then it also just hangs there i mean i'm only doing this for the video right now because for me it makes very little sense to constantly move it you would need a set of assistants uh, to constantly move the, the work but it's fun right now so now we come to the next works and yes this one has moved a bit sorry i will now decide to have decided to not say oh this should have been like that no there was a mix up with the with the uh, sticking it to the wall my assistant is currently on a holiday so this is how it should look stay nah it won't stay whatever sorry uh, so these are small objects but at first uh, i i think it was 2015 something like yes 2015 and i started to work in a refugee uh, organization that my back then fiancé uh, the woman I wanted to get married to uh, had started and I worked there as uh, PR, marketing and uh, general assistant of the directorship and back then I only made videos. I had stopped making paintings, I have stopped making objects all that was lying in the past. I started documentary film and I was quite happy doing political videos and all the like. So when the refugees asked me, what do you do? I showed them some videos and let's say they were not really into that. They they were, they, I think they wanted to see something uplifting and not something about racism in Austria or the Second World War or, or genocide and all these topics that haunt me and that follow me. So uh, I had made some small, really tiny, round objects with faces, smiling faces on it. And just for me, just for fun, I don't know actually why I started. I think I had some sculpting material at home and I just wanted to play around with it. And I burnt them and got the, the finished object to my workspace to the refugees and at some point I just saw one of them being very upset. I think uh, he was afraid of his mother or he just wanted to see his mother. There was something about the mother. I can't re really recall what, what it was uh, because there was a lot of emotionally very uh, downlifting stuff happening there. So I somehow have decided without a conscious decision to, to not think about it that much and then I forgot. But there was, yes, there was a lot of, I mean, we, had, we have so, had a lot of survivors there and we had a lot of people who lost family or at least uh, were afraid that their family could die and me is coming from a refugee family that uh, opened a lot of wounds so i gave one of them one of these smiley faces these round smiling facings and i thought really like okay good this is 
this is such a stupid thing. Why are you actually doing it? But that's the only thing I have in my pocket. The only thing you can't give a person a coin to think that you're happy. It was a sign of humanity for me. I'm going to give you something that maybe, maybe somehow by an absolute chance could lift you up. And yes, the, the guy was really appreciative of it. He got very emotionally in, in a positive way. He said, I really thank you. I will keep that. I will keep that. I will, uh, I think we had a discussion. Is this a talisman? Is this something religion? And so on. It's just like something that you could look at and, and try to have a smile once in a while. And then other refugees came to me and asked for the same thing. And I started to ha hand those things out and I realized I want to have a material practice again. I want to have something that is haptical, that I can touch, that I can work on with my hands. And so that's why I started to go back to my childhood when I was making remote controls out of wood that I found in the woods. And then I started to paint on them and all of them are made from from trash. I mean, I first had an Ikea chair that break, broke down while I was sitting on it. And in, by being a cheap artist, back then still in university, I decided to keep the chair and cut it into pieces and build objects out of it. So here you can see the side of the object and the front. And you can see this, it's, they're all different layers and of, 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 of wood that I collected by uh, inadvertently without me wanting to destroy destroying my IKEA chairs but just trying to sit on them and so this is my series of wish fulfilling machines and the wish fulfilling for machines were also the departure into something fantastical into a place where it's I no longer wanted to talk about uh, politics in the now, I want to talk about them in a form of not abstract way, but I want to tell stories that are seemingly or possibly uh, universal, that can, that where I don't have to make one video for one uh, group and another video for another group where I can show some, where I have something that is, I can where I'm able to show this to people of different backgrounds and they can relate to them uh, each as a, not as a survivor but just as a as somebody who relates to the issues and here uh, yes describing your own artwork is never easy I have to tell you uh, so this is the starting point for the whole thing that I call the inworld. Inworld is the fantasy world I have been writing off, uh, on, off and on again uh, about two and a half years. And I had a very traumatic experience two and a half years ago. And that's when I really had said, I, I have to do something with that. I have to engage with it, but uh, on an so say abstraction layer on a universalist layer, and then I had to. I decided to actually take uh, the history that I have been off part of with my family, with being a family of uh, of, of survivors of, of 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 the of the Nazi horrors and of being refugees from the Soviets and. All these experiences are built into my family story and in the stories that my family tells each other. So I decided to yeah take take that history and make it apparent of 
possible to perceive through other people. And so the, the wish from filling machines are machines in, in this fantasy world, which is, is very much fantastical. So there are no humans there, it's all different kinds of alien looking life forms, but none of them are, let's say, good or nice or easy. They are all com complicated and, 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 and have their own conflicted uh, grey political area, so to speak. So the wishful filling in, uh, uh, machines in that world are machines that can fill you, for, for real certain wishes that are seemingly impossible or uh, that are, go against the line of what is possible by physics and all of that. But the way they are, uh, are made, they are created in that world is through exploitation of other people, of marginalized people. So these magical things have their own uh, history in that world. So there is an upcoming exhibition about only that, them and I'm going to make a publication only about those and the history of that and the criticisms inside of the inworld of these objects. So this is, this is, yes, this is the first pivotal point for what uh, is my new uh, foundational grounding as an artist. It's uh, the, fantasy, the fantasy world, the, the, the places that don't exist, and that are still have reminiscences of of a, of a past that uh, is in somewhat uh, relatable or built on the very histories of this world of of our, our reality. So, and this is the main room. This is the the, the room where I have placed, uh, 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 I have, um, have a thematic exhibition, so to speak. So in the in-world there are many different worlds, to, to, to say it from a, with a philosophical world, there's uh, non-interrelated spheres and then something happens in that world, those spheres uh, find that the, the people in those spheres find a way to connect the, the, those uh, spheres together via something that I, uh, is the hexagonal plane, the game that I've just shown you again before. So let me just find the finger. So this is where you would start. You would come, come into the hexagonal plane here, and then you move around there. You collect and finish this, so you can move there and then you can leave to another sphere. So this is basically that hexagonal travel system, a place between worlds. Uh, uh, you could use, uh, it's like the heavens in some religions, or it's like limbus in others, but it's it's a it's a in between world between worlds. But nobody knows what these worlds are actually are. It's it's very open. Uh, what it could be, but what we know is that suddenly a different different places have been interconnected uh, irreplaceably. The 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 the. the the singular experiences of them are no longer possible. They're now in a collective experience. The fantasy world, the science fantasy world, has met its first globalist event. Suddenly, new avenues, new places are possible. And what happens when people find new places? They make maps. So these are the first maps from that uh, uh, exploration of the hexagonal world. This is the second map, and they are they are 
there are wrong maps and there are maps that uh, try to instill meaning and show show places but none of that is existent it's all conjectural uh, the person who drew this map didn't even visit the place just wanted to sell a map they were a snake oil salesman of a gold rush that nobody actually knew existed and then along came the second uh, uh, people so to speak and really entering the space and then they made a certain uh, kind of map but because nearly everybody back then still believed that the first maps had some figment of reality uh, they related their maps and their map drawing on those original conjectural maps so they built a lot of fantasy in, in it like like seemingly monstrous uh, things uh, objects and architectures that don't exist in the space possibly but maybe they exist and every map has their own mistakes about the world and other things that are real. Again, we see a plant that uh, is trying to kill me by falling on me. Uh, but, sorry. <laughs> I don't think the map is really dangerous to me. Artist killed by a small cardboard painting. I think that's not something that will ever happen to me. So here we have have a monster. We have a monster looking in the world, similar to to, to maps from uh, 1200, 800, uh, from Middle East, where they drew uh, fantastical, amazingly creative things. But none of that is actual reality. And still, even if we go to today, our current map projections are still just projections. They are, in a way, a twisting of facts so they put, can be put, put on a flat plane. So another map, and you see again a monsterish kind of an animal, and, 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 and then you can lose yourself in the imagery and in the objects. There is no, no apparent middle in that object. Everything is some, somehow related to each other and there's a stream uh, coming from one movement to another and that is blocked by, by another uh, form. So, but still these maps are still not correct. So you could not use them safely to go your way in the hexagonal plane. If you go back to the thing, so maybe let's go to the original object. So let's say you would look at this thing and you would say, okay, there's the, mon mon there's the monster. But there's actually no monster there, it's just a hole you fall down. Or the thing tells you, uh, move from there to there, and there is actually something. There is actually a hexagon, you can step on that safely, but there's nothing there. Because the person has misremembered, but still had to sell a map. So, for a long, long time, all of these maps were wrong or included falsehood. And suddenly, a set, a set of people started to make correct maps maps that were mostly correct, that had something like 90 to, to 70 to 80 percent truth hidden inside of them. And that's, that kept on going on for a while, where all of this map mapping was done. And then along came the bureaucracy. And that's the, the symbol, it's their, uh, it's their stamp. And they took all these maps, all these mostly correct maps, and they said all these maps are now outlawed. All the objects used to traverse the hexagonal plane are now illegal. 
we won't allow them. You can't enter this plane on your own now. It is forbidden. And then they said, yes, traveling the hexagon plane is still allowed, but it's not allowed just for anyone. You have to sign, you have to sign a ledger and you have to sign a bureaucratic thing and they build relays, they build travel relays. And so you can move into the travel relay and come out at a different travel relay, like this one. So, by, by doing that, they eliminated the very possibility for using uh, the hexagonal plane from moving from one place to another. And deep, deep down, the bureaucracy won, but the, the technology is still there. People could still travel from one place to another with the hexagon. But yes, that's what happened there. A globalization happened and then the liberalization of people being able to move one from one place to another was eliminated and now there's, they have the first case of both things. They have bureaucratic uh, power forbidding the uh, uh, people the usage of the hexagon plane and they have uh, what is normally brought on by, by globalization. So they have a, a fantastical world of, of monsters and, and everything and that is now in the process of undergoing uh, globalization of sorts that can remind us of the early times when the Roman Empire just came about or when the Ottoman Empire was built or when the colonial empires in Europe started to take what they wanted without thinking about the ethics of others. So this is also so the, the wish fulfilling machines that we all has, have seen earlier are also a product of that very globalization, where a marginalized people without the power to fight back are used for their labor force to build something that is then sell, sold for an extreme profit. And uh, they are then left with all the problems that are non-regrowable uh, uh, resource will bring if it's taken from you. Like we see it in the, in the karst uh, that was created in north of uh, Venice when people tore down uh, a whole uh, uh, tore down all the trees in the, in, in, near to Duino and now there's only a mountain without trees and all the, the earth has been washed away uh, but we have a place, a wondrous, fantastical place like Venice which is own uh, class wars, which is own problems but yes, so this is Every one of these stories has a point of origin of political struggle uh, in this world. But it's still uniquely uh, a world on its own. So that it's, it pertains or hopes to be a fantastical world that can talk about these issues from a universalist or possible, possibly universalist stance. So this is the first uh, uh, curatorial, so to speak, uh, uh, discussion of this exhibition. Thanks for listening for so long. 
and I wish you a very healthy and secure lockdown and last days of this global crisis. Goodbye and good luck.